It's This Week in Creationism, episode 37b. Yeah, this is a follow-up on episode 37, in which Ken Ham says, With his eyes, he can't see any visible evolution, so therefore he concludes evolution hasn't happened. This is an addendum to that. I've run across a very similar example to one I described before, and I thought it would bring it to your attention as a follow-up, uh, as a, an additional illustration to prove the points that I made in episode 37. So we've got Ken Ham can't see change, therefore no evolution, an addendum coming up. In episode 37, we saw Ken Ham um, talking about mayflies. And he was saying mayflies have always been mayflies and he has the proof. He re referenced an article about a new fossil find of a mayfly that was 35 million years old. And you look at that mayfly and it looks a whole lot like a similar species or genus of mayflies that's alive today. And so he noted, look, mayflies look like mayflies in the past. They look like the same thing in the present. Therefore, there no evolution has happened. Apparently, Ken Ham believes that you can judge a book by its cover. If the covers of two books look the same or nearly identical, then the inside contents of those books must therefore also be identical. I went on to point out in episode 37, you can go back and watch that. I did some molecular genetics, uh, molecular genetics uh, or molecular analysis showing that the DNA, the genetic code of two very similar living mayflies today can be as different as, say, a human and a mouse's genomics or DNA sequences. That the internal workings of an organism can, be, can experience enormous amounts of change over time, even while the external morphology of an organism doesn't change. The external morphology of an organism, such as a mayfly, doesn't change because natural selection prevents that kind of change because that organism is highly adapted to a particular environment. Meanwhile, mutations continue to accumulate in its genome and it accommodates those mutations over time by both having neutral mutations, but also mutations to maybe vital things, but adapting them internally. So maybe their physiology is actually different internally uh, between the past and the present. Anyway, enough of that. You can go back and watch episode 37 if you want to get all the details. I just want to show you another example of Ken Ham doing the same thing. Now, he actually did this a week earlier. I just happened to miss that particular article, uh, which is why I'm throwing this in as a little addendum talk. I promise it'll be a lot shorter. So what's Ken Ham interested in this time? He's interested in this algae, this little green alga. And what he's noticed is, again, from a rather clickbaity news site, he has picked up an article that reports on a new fossil find of a very ancient um, green alga that has an appearance very similar to a modern day cadium, which is uh, this particular algae here. And so he titles this uh, blog post, half a billion years, five mass extinctions and no evolution, right? He can't see any change. Therefore, change hasn't occurred. Let's read the majority of this article right here. A new discovery might just change the entire evolutionary timeline. Again, very tiny fossils preserved in 3D rather than squished flat were recently uncovered of a green alga species almost identical to a modern genus of seaweed called cadium and surprisingly complex in quotes. That comes from the article that he, that he, uh, that he, um, that he refers to. Why is this significant? Well, these fossils are in some of the lowest rock layers, making them, in the evolutionary story, older than half a billion years old. Now, in the Young Earth creationist timeline, these rocks aren't even flood rocks. These rocks are from the Precambrian, and most Young Earth creationists believe that the Cambrian, or at least the Precambrian rocks, are not from the global flood, but are actually rocks laid down or layers of sediments, uh, preserving fossils during the time between creation and the flood. And so, well, really, anytime you hear a creationist say, like, you know, how do all the fossils get preserved? Uh, it must have been a chaotic worldwide flood. Well, here's an example of a very um, exceptional preservation of organisms 
uh, in a non-chaotic, non-worldwide flood, according to young Earth creationists. Um, and so they would uh, point to this fossil as being sometime very soon after the original creation of all organisms. So in Ken Ham's mind, he's seeing like, okay, here we see a fossil of a, um, an, an embryo of a algae, and it looks very similar to something that we see alive today. And so over those 6,000 years, we don't see any change. And to him, that's expected, right? It's not been that long. Uh, God made that creature the kind it is, and it's still that same kind of organism today. It hasn't changed from one kind to another. Uh, and yet he has this understanding, or uh, impression or misimpression of evolutionary theory that any organism that is around for more than some X period of time, thousands of years, that it uh, must in fact change from one thing into something else. And this alga couldn't possibly have the same form 500 billion years later. Now, in my uh, episode 37, we talked a lot about what that means, why it is that organisms can actually not change, at least in terms of their external morphology, and even sometimes their internal anatomy. And in this particular algae, they have quite a bit of internal anatomy to show that the internal structures, physical structures, are actually quite similar uh, as well. All right, but here, let's get down right to the point, right? He's saying a half a billion years later, and during that half billion years, there's been mass extinctions, all right? So great upheavals in the earth. Uh, and so how could an organism not have adapted to those extinctions or changed during all this, different, all this time? He doesn't see that change, and no evolution occurred, right? He's just making a, a statement of, as, as if it's a statement of fact. These have not evolved. All right. I went and looked at the article. And he, um, I, I just don't think that, um, and remember, Ken Ham didn't write this article, just like he doesn't write most of these articles, even though his name's on it. His research team wrote this article for him. I think he might have stumbled across the news item because he is, uh, apparently looking at a lot of uh, clickbaity news, you know, science news sites. All right. I don't think he reads the original literature. So he's looking at like these stories, it's like what can I come up with? Forwards it off to his research team and they write up this blurb for him. Did they go look at the original paper? Usually uh, the evidence suggests that they don't um, because they mimic and talk with in very flamboyant language about the finds and it's the same language used in the clickbait articles which are naturally you know enhancing and um, exaggerating really the importance of you know the original research paper and i don't want to diminish the the fact that these uh, these folks came up with a really interesting and i think you know it does have some significance this particular uh, fossil but is it going to overturn the timeline of evolutionary biology like ken ham says okay once again you know this one fossil is going to upset the entire uh, evolutionary dogma in terms of timeline um that's almost never the case when you hear anytime you hear somebody saying that that's what's happening that's not what's really happening yes change to our ideas of timeline are occurring but let me explain by just reading a little bit of the abstract of the original article a stem group caudium algae caudium alga from the latest edia karen right edia karen is a fauna of organisms found in multiple different locations on earth that date to the pre-cambrian period so more than 535 550 million years ago uh, provides taxonomic insight into the early diversification of the plant kingdom uh, plants are some of the oldest organisms according to the fossil record. They are found in the deepest layers uh, of the fossil record as multicellular organisms. So the abstract, in the abstract, in recent years, Precambrium life forms have generated an ever-increasing interest because they revealed a rich eukaryotic diversity prior to the Cambrian explosion. Most people have heard of this Cambrian explosion thing, thinking that it, it makes it sound like all the major, um, well, Many of the major animal body plants uh, are derived during the Cambrian period. That's when we see those particular body plants occur. But we're finding out now there's actually quite a rich flora and fauna that existed prior to the Cambrian in what's called this Edia Karen. Among them, macroalgae, so algae that are larger than single cells, 
are known to be conspicu a conspicuous component of these ecosystems, right? So it's already been known that there's a lot of different forms of algae uh, in these uh, Precambrian ecosystems. And chlorophytes, chlorophytes would be green organisms, green algae, in particular, they are already documented in the Tonani. Oh, that's, that's the name of the, the different formation that's, that we're talking about, Precambrian formation. When they were so far expected to originate, However, like other major eukaryotic lineages, and despite predictions of molecular clock analysis placing roots of these lineages well into the neo preterozoic right, well into, meaning really far down into this Precambrian period, molecular clock analyses, that's where you look at the genetic difference between different algae. So you look at the genetic difference between even modern green algae, and you say, how long ago would these have had a common ancestor? if all these differences you see them in today came from mutations that are occurring, right, and accumulating in these different lineages. And if you back calculate how long that would take based on the molecular clock or the, the rate at which mutations accumulate, you can calculate how far back in time that common ancestor must have existed. And if there's a common ancestor between two green algal macro algal lineages, then you're predicting that there would be a macroalgal organism living at that time period. And what's, what's happened for a lot, of, a lot of groups over the last uh, 20 years, as we've been able to do a lot more genomic analysis, is that we've been able to do these types of calculations. And those calculations have suggested that many lineages alive today share common ancestors farther back in time than we have actual physical evidence from fossils. Now the fossil record is quite scant in some cases in, if for a lot of different organisms. Um, and so the very earliest fossil we find, it doesn't always align with the prediction based on molecular biology of when the vast differences, and see you see how this fits with my theme here, um, the internal differences between organisms, the, the vast amount of genetic difference, to account for that, you have to have a lot of time pass if, if, if this accumulates at some regular rate. And so for 10, 15, even 20 years, there's already been predictions, all right, from evolutionary theory, from specifically from molecular evolutionary theory. Molecular evolutionists have predicted that eventually we should find and see fossils that are older than the current oldest fossils that we know about. In other words, if you go out and keep looking, we expect that we'll find additional fossils in older aged rocks that appear to be the ancestors of these modern groups. All right, so despite predictions of molecular clock analysis playing roots of these lineages well in the Proterozoic, a taxonomic constraint on Precambrian green algae has re a taxonomic constraint on Precambrian green algae has remained difficult. Um, uh, so we don't have many fossils in order to be able to, you know, test this idea that that really these lineages go back that far. Well, then then comes along this fossil, right? Here we present an exceptionally preserved spherical unicellular alga from the latest uh, Ediacaran formation in South China, which is 540 million years ago. They look at the external and internal morphology and determine that this is very similar to a modern green alga. And most importantly, it is a green algal lineage uh, and a multicellular organism found in a very early set of rocks. In other words, it fits the prediction of molecular clock analyses. So molecular evolutionists have been predicting that we should actually find something like this in rocks that are this old. And here somebody has gone out, opened up some rocks that old, and they have found what molecular evolutionists have predicted. Now, like some young earth creationist would say, um, predictions made and predictions fulfilled is the gold standard, right, of, <laughs> of science, right? You make a prediction about what you should see before you actually see it, and then you find it. That gives you confidence that the thing you were using to make that prediction is... Uh, has some validity to it, right? So these molecular analyses that are making these predictions, and this isn't the only case where this has happened, this is happening quite a bit in a lot of different groups, 
including dinosaurs and other things, about predictions about where we should see and when we should see particular fossils in the fossil record. And as we continue to explore the fossil record, we continue to confirm a lot of these predictions uh, about where common ancestors or things that are related to common ancestors of these organisms should exist um, in the geological column. So rather than being surprising and shocking and requiring a complete reanalysis of the timeline of evolutionary history, this timeline has already been predicted to be the, the probable timeline of the origin of green algae of these types. And now we have actual physical evidence that matches the, the, the uh, uh, geological dating that matches the molecular predictions that places these organisms at that time. And so rather than upheaval, this is actually helping to confirm what many molecular evolutionists, which are a, a growing and more influential group within evolutionary biology, uh, beginning to confirm those uh, predictions that they have made. So that's why I say it's an interesting fossil. It helps us, it helps to confirm some analyses that have already been done. Uh, so that's great. It's not revolutionary, right? It's not upturning everything. As I said before, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say again that, uh, uh, you know, Ken Ham wants to look at these two organisms and treat them as if I see two things that look like identical book covers. And therefore, I want to believe that nothing in them has changed, even though if you were to open those books, right, if we were able to go back and take a look at that fossil and we were able to dig out the genome from that fossil and maybe do a bunch of studies of the physiology of that fossil, like the enzymes that it's making and the enzymatic pathways and so forth, and analyze them, I strongly suspect we'd find that there is massive differences between that organism then and organisms, organisms today, that their genomes would be wildly different. Um, and so the, the, the books of organisms can't be judged by their external covers. Uh, and that's something that just doesn't seem to have sunk in for Ken Ham. Um, also, I'll make a prediction. It's hard to confirm this prediction. But my prediction would be that if you could do that, if you could look at that organism from 500 million years ago, that you would find that it would be more different from each other, all right, from a, a present day organism that looks very similar than say the mayflies, which are 35 million years apart. And even though they look similar, they probably wouldn't be as genetically different because there isn't as much time, so not as many mutations would have accumulated in those lineages. Just like if you, as I was pointing out before, if you look at, uh, if you look at organisms like, uh, that are very similar species today that are only predicted to have become different species in the last couple thousand years, well, they're very similar in terms of their genetics, just like they're similar in terms of their external morphology. So there you have, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, it correlates with each other. External morphology represents approximately the similarity of their internal genetics. But the more divergent, the more time that has passed since they share a common ancestor, the more genetically different they will become. That's inevitable. Genetic divergence occurs. And so the more time there is, the more genetic divergence occurs. But there's no rule that says that external morphology has to follow the same pattern. External morphology, or how the organism is interacting directly with its external environment, uh, can remain nearly identical over hundreds of millions of years, while the internal genetics of the organism are constantly undergoing change. And so the organism is evolving because evolution is change over time and most of the time we are talking about change in terms of population genetics. We're talking about the, the genetic inner workings of an organism as representing the change of an organism. And if you want to define evolution by external change, then you have, to, you, have to, you have to incorporate into that definition the fact that you don't, that, that those characters don't have to change over time. You can't have an expectation that the external morphology will change. 
if your only definition of evolution includes external morphology. Um, yeah, so Canaham's done it again. Once again, he just looks at the world around him. He sees things that are similar, and he can't, he, he can't understand the nuance that an organism's external appearance is not all that an organism is. Just like two people that look identical to one another aren't necessarily the same people. And uh, it's, it's just frustrating. Um, but as I said in episode 37, it's not surprising, right? Because this is something that anybody could do. This is a misconception that any non-biologist would have. They look at organisms like horseshoe crabs, and it's a compelling argument to make. Look, there's a horseshoe crab from 300 million years ago, and here's one today. You hold them up, and they look to the, to the, to the non-expert eye. They basically look like the same organism. Um, and so it sounds like a good argument that they haven't changed. But in fact, they really have changed. They've changed enormously by most measures. They have experienced a, a large amount of change. All right, I promised I'd keep this short. I feel like now it's not short. So I must, I must say goodbye. But before I do, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. And we'll be back with uh, This Week in Creationism episode, whatever I'm up to next. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.